Welcome to this episode of the ASHRA podcast. I'm Fred Wyan, Director of Communications with the American Sexual Health Association, ASHA. In this episode, we're talking about some big news in the world of the prevention of sexually transmitted infections, an update on the use of the antibiotic doxycycline as a means of preventing bacterial STI, specifically gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis. Our guest is Dr. Philip A. Chan, an associate professor in the Department of Medicine at Brown University. Dr. Chan is also a physician at the Rhode Island Department of Health, also serves as chief medical officer of Open Door Health, the state's only LGBTQ plus health center. He also has his own podcast, Public Health Out Loud. So I'm hoping maybe we can work a little cross promotion here. But Dr. Chan, welcome to the ASHA podcast. We're really glad to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Good deal. All right, so let's get to it. In early June, just about a week ago from when we're recording this, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, published guidelines on the use of doxypep to prevent the bacterial STIs that I mentioned, specifically in men who have sex with men and transgender women. Uh, and Dr. Chen was an author on these guidelines, so he's the one we need to talk to. Let's start with the basics. So would you just talk a bit about the concept of PEP and the use of doxy to prevent these infections? What is doxypep? So Fred, this is very exciting. I think as we all know, bacterial STIs have really been increasing uh, significantly over the last couple of decades. And we're talking, of course, about syphilis, chlamydia, and gonorrhea. And doxycycline really is one of the first, the first um, chemoprophylactic medications to prevent uh, these bacterial STIs. So it's very exciting. And many of us hope that this will sort of be a game changer as we talk about addressing STIs. So when we talk about this medication, doxycycline. So doxycycline, first off, is a very common antibiotic. It's actually been approved uh, by the FDA here in the United States since 1967. We have lots of experience. Lots of people take it for lots of different reasons, uh, including things ranging from acne to a lot of different bacterial infections. It's also the first line treatment for chlamydia treatment, and it's a second line treatment for syphilis, and it has activity against gonorrhea. So someone had this brilliant idea uh, to use it as actually a preventive medication uh, against these bacterial STIs, and it does just that. It works in terms of preventing these bacterial STIs. Okay. So what is PEP? I, I think it's post-exposure prophylaxis. Did I say that correctly? You did, yes. So it does get a little confusing. And I, in fact, I think a lot of people sometimes get confused about this. You know, in the field of HIV prevention, right, we have PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis. So PRE stands for before you're ever exposed, you're going to be taking a pill a day to prevent HIV infection. Post-exposure means that you're going to take something after an exposure. Uh, so doxycycline has been studied now as post-exposure prophylaxis. And basically the concept is, is that after you have sex, and that includes uh, anal, oral, or vaginal sex, you take a dose of doxycycline at 200 milligrams, ideally as soon after, ideally within 24 hours, but up to 72 hours. And it's been shown to be about 80% effective in preventing syphilis and chlamydia and about 50% uh, uh, effective in preventing gonorrhea. This is some pretty good numbers. Um, let me ask you, why is doxypep currently recommended only for men who have sex with men and transgender women? So we have seen a disproportionate uh, burden of bacterial STIs in that group. And I think the studies really focused on those groups to begin with. I think that's important to note. Uh, if you look at some of the you know pharmacodynamic studies that have been done, we do see, for example, that doxycycline builds up in significant quantities in the cervix and in the cisgender female reproductive tract. So we do expect that doxycycline will also work as post-exposure prophylaxis in cisgender females and transgender men and other people that have a vagina. I think the one slight challenge, and I don't wanna call it a setback, but uh, somewhat disappointing, was there was one study uh, called the um, Doxypep Kenyan study done out of Kenya uh, that looked at Doxypep in cisgender heterosexual women. And unfortunately it did not find that it worked. Now, when people analyzed and dove into that study, they found that it was likely because people that were supposed to be taking doxypep weren't taking it. So it was an adherence issue, uh, not so much of the fact that it didn't actually work. However, um, because of that, uh, and also because the CDC is really focused, of course, on evidence and, and making recommendations that are really evidence-based, the evidence isn't quite there yet for 
uh, for cisgender um, females and other people that have a vagina. Now, that being said, certainly as a physician myself, I've had lots of discussions with cisgender females, people that I uh, uh, think that are at risk of bacterial STIs, and I do prescribe it on a case-by-case -case basis. I think that CDC just wasn't, there wasn't enough evidence to make a broad recommendation for it. Okay. Well, would you mind defining cisgendered female? What does that mean? Yeah, of course. So cisgender, um, in, the, in, the, in the gender world, we talk about cisgender and transgender. So cisgender means uh, that you identify uh, now as the same gender that you were uh, born with. So we talk about the sex that you were born and your current gender identity. Transgender person is someone that was born a different gender uh, than what they than what they identify with now. Okay, thank you. Um, getting back to the to the populations uh, for whom doxypep is recommended, this is not a blanket recommendation for all men who have sex with men and transgender women, right? There's uh, is there's a nuance to it. How to how do you sort out within those communities which patients may be the ones who could benefit from this? Yeah, it's a great question. And if you see, you know, if you read the CDC recommendations, and there's a lot of discussion about this internally, you know, the wording specifically says uh, that um, uh, that men who have sex with men and transgender women who have had a bacterial STI diagnosed in the last 12 months should receive counseling to do about doxypep. And then it further goes on to say that the CDC recommends um, that there should be shared decision making between the provider and the patient about prescribing doxypep. So it's not necessarily saying that all, right, that all um, men who have sex with men or transgender women should be on doxypep, but it is saying that everyone um, should know about it, especially people that have had a past bacterial STI, and then through this process of shared decision making, which frankly, we should all be doing anyway. Okay. Let me, uh, you, you uh, when I ask you why it the, these guidelines are specifically for uh, men who have sex with men and transgender women. You talked about how they are disproportionately impacted with these particular STIs. Um, and I wanted to just explore that with you for, for a minute, if, if that's okay. Um, why are these populations vulnerable? I'll just throw that out there and then I can respond. But what, what, why, why is this such an issue with these populations? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, in for as an example for syphilis, uh, we do see uh, a high number of cases in uh, men in general, and specifically um, gay and bisexual men, other men who have sex with men, and it's really a multifactorial reasoning, right? So once these these are infections, uh, once they start in the population, they get concentrated. Uh, it's a network effect, right? So people, you know, if you're having sex with other people in this group, then you're just more likely to come across it. Some of it has to do uh, with the association of HIV infection. I think, as you know, we see a higher number of HIV cases still, unfortunately, among gay and bisexual men. A lot of times we see syphilis transmitted along with HIV. And then there's other factors such as substance use, uh, such as condom use, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really a whole um, host of reasons of why we see these, uh, these bacterial STIs at higher prevalence. I will say though, Fred, I think to your point and what you're getting at, um, and one thing that I worry about, of course, is that in uh, women, cisgender women, people that do have a vagina, we do worry more specifically about chlamydia and about gonorrhea in that group, because of course, they're at risk of more significant sequelae of those infections, things like pelvic inflammatory disease, ectopic pregnancy, infertility, et cetera. So I do worry more about those infections, especially in cisgender women, uh, syphilis, of course, is a nasty infection, no matter who gets it. And we definitely see pretty significant complications of that. Yeah. And uh, I know the CDC surveillance data that came out earlier this year talked about the jump in the number of congenital syphilis cases, syphilis among newborns. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot to unpack with all of these infections. Um, let me ask you one more thing on this topic, if I may, before we move on. Um, you talked about some of the reasons why, why, uh, MSM and transgender women are, are disproportionately impacted. How much of this gets back to social determinants? I mean, I, I, what got me thinking about that is, is the open door health clinic that you run. It's uh, an LBGTQ plus clinic. I imagine that's pretty welcoming. I imagine it's very well attuned to its patients, but not all clinics are, right? I mean, how much of a barrier is that kind of thing? 
I do believe it's a significant barrier. You know, I see a number of patients uh, that unfortunately have not felt comfortable going elsewhere. Uh, even this past week, you know, I've seen people that haven't engaged with a provider, a physician, a clinic uh, in the last couple of years because they just haven't felt comfortable or they've had bad experiences. So just as we talk about um, uh, systems approaches and structural determinants of health, you know, all of us really need to create settings, atmospheres, clinics, organizations uh, that are welcoming and respectful at the very least uh, and certainly affirming. And I, I do think that that's a big barrier, especially for the LGBTQ population. Uh, you know, we're recording this in June, so it's Pride Month uh, celebration of the LGBTQ community. Uh, and I think it, I think it's a big thing. So I think as we think about how to improve access uh, for sexual health, for STI care, really striving to make our clinics and our settings as welcoming and affirming as possible. Okay. All right, here's a, here's a question more on the clinical side. So doxypep is not just a one-time intervention, right? Would you talk about what kind of follow-up testing is needed and why that testing is so important? Yeah, so doxycycline, as I mentioned, it's been, we, it's been approved since 1967. So we have a, a, lot, of, um, a lot of knowledge and experience with it. Uh, it's relatively cheap, so that's a good thing. So we you know, we've, um, you know, HIV prep has been expensive and that's been a barrier, but the good news is that doxycycline is a little bit of an older medication, so it's cheap. Um, I am uh, reassured and actually optimistic about its use as post-exposure uh, in terms of minimizing side effects and adverse events. So doxycycline in general is a very safe medication. Uh, it, you know, when we talk about this antibiotic, you know, some people can have some gastrointestinal symptoms, things like nausea, vomiting, abdominal discomfort. Some people can get a rash on it. Some people can potentially feel a little bit dizzy, um, et cetera. That's in a small number of people, but most people don't have anything. That being said, I am certainly reassured that people are taking it periodically. So as post-exposure, these studies that have been done that have looked at sort of these adverse events on doxycycline were people that were taking it every day. And so obviously, if you're taking the medication every day, you're going to have more side effects. So hopefully, we do see people tolerate this medication. Um, and uh, again, it's very safe. And, you know, I'm also reminded, too, that doxycycline has been prescribed as a, ma a malaria prophylaxis uh, mm. for people going overseas. So people do take this medication for um, for months and months. And it's also a medication for acne treatment. So again, people are on this for months and months, if not years, uh, in some settings. Okay. And if you were to prescribe doxypep for a patient, when would you want them to come back? Come back in a month, come back in three months? How often would you want to see that person? The other piece of good news about doxycycline is that there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of laboratory monitoring that, that has to happen. For people that we prescribe doxypep to, we do recommend that they come in every three to six months for STI testing. Uh, and that's one thing too that the CDC guidelines really point out is that doxypep, you know, it's one uh, of many different approaches that we need to use for STI prevention. Uh, and that includes STI testing as well. It includes vaccination for things like MPOX and HPV, uh, encouraging condom use, uh, et cetera. Okay, all right. Um, so, all right, so you touched on some of the side effects. It sounds like most people don't have a lot of trouble, if any, but with, with doxy and um, uh, they tend to be so, I mean, once the person's no longer taking the medication, they tend to go away. So that is really good news. I want to ask you about this idea of antimicrobial resistance or put it in other ways. We hear a lot about like antibiotic resistant gonorrhea and how certain types of gonorrhea are becoming, they're just not, the antibiotics don't work as well with them anymore. Is there anything to think about here? Are we over prescribing antibiotics or are you worried about that at all? It's a great question. And the answer is yes, we worry about antimicrobial resistance uh, all the time for lots of different things. Uh, you know, doxycycline is an important antibiotic. You know, as an infectious disease physician, uh, we do use doxycycline for a whole host of things. It's one of those antibiotics that also treats a lot of unusual infections. We use it to treat things uh, like Lyme disease. Uh, we use it to treat um, Staph aureus infections, just a whole range of different infections. So we, of course, want to be judicious in its use. And this is one thing that has been cited as a concern. It's something that we do need to watch closely. It's something that we need to stay on top of. 
uh, as public health organizations, as clinicians and scientists, and we want to use it judiciously. Uh, you know, in terms of gonorrhea, we are concerned that we will see some increasing resistance there. Uh, that is the um, the bacteria, the infection that we do worry the most about. The good news is that we really haven't seen much resistance to doxycycline, really any, in syphilis uh, or chlamydia, so that's reassuring. And I'm also a little bit concerned about resistance in some other infections too, some sort of unintended consequences, things like community-acquired MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph aureus, uh, some of these other commonly um, uh, prevalent infections like MRSA are generally sensitive to doxycycline. Uh, and in the clinic world, we use a lot of doxycycline to treat things like you know, community-acquired MRSA. So if we do see uh, some resistance there, that could definitely make it harder to treat some of these other common infections that we see. Okay. Um, you touched on this earlier when you were talking about the uh, doxy study, doxy pep studies with cisgendered women. If you were to gaze into your crystal ball, do you think we'll see doxy pep recommended or approved for other populations at some point? Um, what do you think? I do think that we will. I know that there's um, some studies that are starting up uh, looking at cisgender women, people who have a vagina, and I do think so. I think in the real world, you know, a lot of my colleagues, myself included, will be prescribing doxypep uh, for women uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, now, the recommendations, again, are for uh, uh, men who have sex with men and transgender women. But again, there's no reason to expect that this won't work in women. Okay, fair enough. Um, so the last thing I want to ask you about uh, is, well, we always like to try and offer our listeners, uh, our viewers, uh, some practical tips they can use. So in the show notes, we're going to link to uh, your podcast. We're going to link to the Open Door Health Clinic. We're also going to link to a CDC clinic locator. So no matter where people are, they can, they can find some help. Uh, but let me ask you on that. What tips would you recommend to empower patients? Like, should they proactively ask for doxypep? And if so, what do they say to the provider? How do they break the ice in that conversation? It's a great question. You know, I I, I would um, I do think that some people should proactively ask. I think when there's a new thing that's out there in medicine, uh, you know, sometimes doctors just haven't had a chance to catch up. So I think sometimes as a patient, it's great to be proactive to do a little research and to kind of push your provider, physician, uh, or otherwise uh, about things like doxypep. And doxypep is really new. And the other point that I'll make too is that, you know, I think a lot of people are concerned about HIV and getting HIV, rightly so, even though HIV is more of a chronic disease now and great medications to treat it. But some of these other bacterial STIs, and I'm thinking specifically about syphilis, can really cause um, significant long-term complications. And so I'm really optimistic about uh, doxycycline as post-exposure prophylaxis. I do think that people should consider it, especially if you've had, you know, I think for sure, if you've had multiple bacterial STI infections, there's no doubt in my mind that you should really get on it uh, if you continue to be sexually active. Uh, I think if you've had at least, if you've had one bacterial STI infection in the past, and it's worth having a discussion depending on your current sexual activity. And I think that if you have, you know, more than one partner and are not in a monogamous relationship, then it's worth considering whether or not you're male or female uh, to just be aware about it, look into it, have an educated discussion with your provider to see if it could be right for you. Okay. Dr. Philip Chan has been our guest today. Look, thank you for your time. And I, I imagine we'll come back to you as we learn more about DoxyPep when these programs ramp up, right? We'll see exactly what it's like more in the real world, I guess. And of course, if there is approval for other populations. So this is probably an ongoing discussion. I know you'll be looking at some of that data pretty closely yourself, right? So um, thank you for that. Uh, I mentioned your podcast. Public Health Out Loud, which I know is available through Apple and iHeart. I'm assuming Android as well. Uh, so we'll link to that and uh, take a listen, folks. Um, thank you, Dr. Chan, for your time. Thank you, intrepid listener, for tuning in to this conversation. You know, check back with us often because we roll things like this out all the time. Send feedback, including ideas for future podcast episodes, info at ashesexualhealth.org. And until next time, take care, everybody. Bye.